I was hoping to tell you a little bit of the, both the CEDAW from a disability perspective, from a perspective of how CEDAW has been used and is continuing and needs to be continued to use as a tool for empowering and uh, promoting uh, women's rights, including disabled women's rights. But also to tell you a little bit about the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, which also has, a, has some new tools and new perspectives on rights promotion, human rights promotion, and has some relevance also to how we bring CEDAW forward. Uh, just a word about uh, where I come from and the European Disability Forum. They are European and uh, national umbrellas of disability organizations that have as their basis the promotion of human rights. And I would like to, let's say, start from the CRPD. Uh, I'm assuming that it's not so well known to most of you. It's the latest in the series of UN, uh, UN treaties, and it, it's also one of the most ratified in the sense that there are, I'm um, just having a peek at my papers here, there are 158 signatories to date of the convention. Finland, I'm afraid, is a signatory, but not yet um, a ratifying. Um, the ratification process, I would say very optimistically, and I would also quote the minister this morning, we are hoping very much that the ratification process will finish by the end of this government period, that is within a year. So why do we need a new convention? Because all the, all the, all the rights that we already have uh, also are and include persons with disabilities. And that's a question that the only answer can lie in the lack of proper implementation in the existing treaties. And also considering the global context of this meeting, we have to recall that approximately 80% of disabled people in the world live in developing nations. So this is very much also an issue, a global issue. And it's also a response to the fact that although uh, those uh, human rights conventions that we already have offer some, um, let's say, protections, but uh, it still hasn't actually um, it hasn't materialized. The potential for protection of disabled persons hasn't been tapped properly. So disabled people continue to have problems in terms of being left in the margin of society in all parts of the world, including the first world, Europe, and my own country. And the what I think is the key promise of the, and the, I think the most important, sorry, that um, um, is the fact that the convention strengthens the realization of rights of persons with disabilities. It strengthens the prohibition of discrimination on the ground of disability. And also, as mentioned earlier, it emphasizes that we need positive measures as um, a tool, an acceptable tool, for the realization of full equality. There is also in the treaty a strong emphasis on social development. And it's important to note that the treaty uh, identifies those areas 
where uh, adaptations need to be made so that persons with disabilities can effectively exercise their rights and also identifies areas where rights protection has not been sufficient, where the protection needs to be strengthened. And uh, just a note about the paradigm shift. It's very traditional that persons with disabilities were viewed as objects. We were objects of charity, medical treatment, and social protection. We were not subject with rights, capable of claiming those rights and making decisions for our lives based on free and informed consent and being active as members of society. Um, for the course of time, I'm jumping a little bit to, uh, from a discussion of what disability is under the convention and to highlight that it's, that the article one, um, and this is interesting in the context of CRPD and CEDO, because CEDO, as we all know, eliminates, or the goal is boldly to eliminate all forms of discrimination against women. In the CRPD, I'm afraid, the level of, let's say, goal setting or objective was set a little bit lower. Uh, and it's only to promote, protect, and ensure full and equal enjoyment of all human rights and fundamental freedoms by all persons of disabilities and to promote respect for their inherent dignity. It's for all of us to ponder a little bit why the elimination of discrimination on the ground of disability couldn't be a goal for the global community. I would also like to highlight in terms of the general principles that the participation, we haven't talked so much today about participation, but it's important that full and effective participation and inclusion in society is recognized in the convention. And it's recognized both as a general principle, but also a part of the general obligations. And in some areas, that is political participation and participation in, in cultural life, leisure, and sports as a specific rights. We've already discussed the, um, the principle of non-discrimination in earlier speeches, but I would like to highlight a very important, very important new element that the, that the CRBD brings, and this is that part of the discrimination or the discriminatory framework that we are trying to abolish and eliminate is is to ensure that um, different spheres of life are accessible. So in the definition, uh, in the, let's say, the whole convention and its principles uh, are important in, um, in empowering and, in, and bringing about inclusion in, as an end of, of in itself not just means of, of accessing other rights. And the issue of um, accessibility, there's a debate going on internationally whether accessibility can be a right in itself or just a means or a tool or an instrument of accessing other rights. And um, regardless of what the conclusion of that international debate is going to be, it's very important to remember that in the CRPD, the definition of discrimination is highlighted with a very important addition. And it starts very much 
very familiarly uh, to those of you who know CEDA, any distinction, exclusion, or restriction on the basis of disability, which has the purpose or effect of impairing or nullifying the recognition, enjoyment, or exercise on an equal basis with others of all human rights and fundamental freedoms in the political, economic, social, cultural, civil, or any other field. It includes all forms of discrimination, including denial of reasonable accommodation. And here we come back to the very sort of fundamental idea of removing barriers of access to different spheres in life. And this is where CEDO and CRPD can really reinforce each other. And, and uh, other speakers have already referred to problems in terms of data collection. I would also add my voice to those who highlight the fact that our country has not yet been able to legislate or somehow codify the prohibition of multiple discrimination. Also, the issue of violence against women is particularly acute for women with disabilities. The issue of political participation, we have had many, many good numbers here about participation in, in political life, how many percent are women, and Finland is very proud. Um, for my own part, I would be very proud if I could, like in the 1980s, see someone who is disabled in a visible way to be part of the national parliament. But nowadays, we don't, we don't have any disabled parliamentarians. And also, very few of us are in, uh, in the public sphere. And that is an uh, aspiration for the future, perhaps, because we need the role models. So the challenges on, on implementation that has, have already been touched on are very much an issue of access. The access change also needs attitudinal change. And this calls for also for this to be realized. We need uh, support measures, very practical support measures, but very crucial. The legal definition of reasonable accommodation in the CRPD is six um, lines long. I will not read it to you at the moment, but you may ponder why is, why is it that reasonability has so many barriers and steps before you uh, arrive at the conclusion that something is reasonable. I would also like to highlight very sadly, very recent development that many countries are saying, uh, many parties in the international discourse on international law are now saying that denial of reasonable accommodation isn't exactly a form of discrimination, which is dire directly counter to the letter of the CRPD. And I would also say that the whole idea where there are so many, so many elements to look at in the evaluation of reasonability was just the fact that we wanted to be sure that when it's reasonable, it has to be done. If it's not reasonable for public or private actors, then we have to re rely on pro progressive realization. So my view on this debate, whether accessibility is a human right or not, uh, I'm still waiting for the, let's say, best argument. But I would say that the potential of the CRPD is not fulfilled if access to different spheres of life is not improved. So whether it's considered a right or an instrument 
is a, it is an essential one. And it's a reaffirmation. Without that, we cannot realize the full potential of the human of all human rights for disabled women and men for that matter. Thank you very much.